Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live edition here on my channel, Luis Borrero, Visual Artist. Thank you for coming by. Today we have an exciting, exciting presentation about one of my favorite painters, Vermeer, and his technique and his use of the camera scura. I have a lot of information to share today. It's going to be very intense. Welcome. Thank you for coming by once again. We're almost at 900 followers. I would have never thought that there's such an interest in painting techniques, but again, thank you for coming by, for your wonderful support. I have uh, some of the uh, viewers writing me on Instagram asking me about Vermeer's techniques, and it's uh, shocking because I never thought that a painter from the 17th century would, uh, would captivate such passion in, in artists from today, so it's good. It's good to, to see that, and it's exciting to share the knowledge. Um, I've done a lot of research for this live presentation. These live presentations are not easy. They're, they take, they require a lot of work. Um, they require a lot of research. There's a lot of uh, uh, publications that are wonderful and I have to sort through them to find out uh, which uh, research is up to date. There's a, some um, techniques, uh, some analytical techniques on uh, in restoration and the art technological research that are sort of outdated. So I, I, I had to do a lot of homework for this live presentation, but I have a, a lot of exciting information so that I want to share. So um, before I get started, I, I really, really appreciate it if you guys uh, subscribe to the channel, share the content. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear your comments throughout the live presentation. You're welcome to participate. Uh, I want to hear your comments, um, your materials. If you're, if I, I have a, a lot of, uh, of you that are writing uh, about the materials that you, you're using in your own works. So it's great. It's great to share all that information and you know who you are, where you're, uh, you know, viewing uh, the show from, you know. So that's, it's, it's great. So, um, okay, so let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, and sweaty palms, thank you for coming by. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, that's uh, from California. That's great. I grew up in California. Miss California is a wonderful state, and uh, a lot of great artists there. A lot of a lot of great museums. I remember going to the Norton Simon and the Lachman Museum. So it's great. Thank you for coming by. Hopefully you'll have some questions, and I could answer some of them. So all right. So let's just go ahead and get started with the references now. Uh, I have this wonderful book here from the 1990s, I believe, Vermeer Studies. It's a, a, a go-to book for a lot of artists that were interested in Vermeer uh, and a lot of great research. Uh, I've been uh, studying this book for years, and um, it's a pretty thorough book. I, uh, I mean, I've learned a lot from it, uh, but recently uh, I started going through my notes uh, for this you know, in particular, because, you know, it's, there's a lot of information today that, uh, you know, you could access through uh, the internet. So it's important to keep up to date and, uh, you know, take a look at the latest um, research that is going on in the museums. And I wanted to, I just did a simple um, uh, search on Google and I found a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource uh, from I believe is Heritage Science. And uh, I think about two years, three years ago, they did a, uh, an exhibition called Girl in the Spotlight. And they did uh, a whole series of studies um, using as a point of departure this very uh, book. And uh, they sort of updated a lot of the, um, the, the research. And I started reading through it and to my surprise, a lot of the information has been updated. So I'm going to be sharing uh, that article with you guys. Uh, once I finish the live presentation, I will share that link. Uh, it's important to, to, you know, to have the references, uh, you know, give credit to the, to the people that are doing the research. So heritage science. And I'm also going to be using some uh, 3D imaging from uh, micropano.com. This is uh, a, a a website that uh, has posted uh, very detailed images of the girl with the pearl earring, and they have done some 3D scanning of the painting. 
to see the topography of the painting. This, I mean, this just blew my mind because, you know, here I am, I'm used to the books and the chemical analysis, and now we're doing 3D uh, mapping of a painting surface. It's just amazing what technology has done uh, for, you know, for artists and scientists. So it's great. So today, um, and of course, this will have to be a two-part series because this, I have so much information to share. I just, even today, we're probably going to, uh, you know, extend our time to about an hour because it's just a lot of information um, that I want to be sharing with you guys. So we're going to be uh, probably here for about an hour. Uh, and of course, I'll be recording the live presentation so you could, uh, you know, come back to it if you, if you need to. So I'm gonna be talking about the palette and the pigments. Um, I wanna talk about the technique, uh, but before I get started, um, I wanna just talk a little bit about who Vermeer was. For a lot of you that are into the arts and are you know, artists yourselves, uh, you already know who Vermeer is. But for those of you that do not know who Vermeer is, uh, Vermeer was one of the greatest uh, Dutch painters uh, that lived during the 17th century. He was born in 1632, uh, born in Delft. And um, he's, he, his apprenticeship is not really known. I, I, I tried to find information about who his teacher might have been. Uh, the only uh, theory uh, that is posted on Wikipedia is essentially uh, uh, Karel Fabricius. He was a student of Rembrandt. And uh, it, there's an excerpt from a 17th century uh, uh, I believe there's a manuscript from another local painter from Delft that details that uh, Vermeer might have studied with Karel Fabricius. So that's essentially, uh, you know, the only source that I could find. So it's not really known, but um, I did find information about his uh, St. Luke, Guild of St. Luke membership. He, he became a member, member when he was 21 years old. And surprisingly, he was the father of 11 children, which it's shocking to me. I mean, how did he have any time to paint, right? I mean, it's it's uh, pretty amazing. Um, and unfortunately, he died at the age of 42. Uh, not a very, very prolific painter. So there's a lot of mysteries that surrounds Vermeer for these reasons. He died very young. His paintings are just exceptional. Um, and his style was quite unique. And today I want to center on uh, where his style might have come from. I mean, the influences... Um, and the, the technique that he developed. Uh, there's a theory uh, that a lot of art historians share that he might have used the camera obscura. And I'm gonna be talking about the camera obscura. For those of you that follow me on Instagram, I posted some images that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sharing with you of an image uh, or a working sequence that he might have used working with the camera obscura. So, but before we do that, I wanna share some images of his progression as an artist. We're going to begin with an image, uh, Christ in the house of Martha and Mary from 1654. And I'm sharing these paintings because um, these early paintings do not represent his development later on. They're, these are allegorical paintings. Uh, they're mostly religious subjects. And Vermeer seems to uh, you know, begin with this type of very traditional uh, sort of Italianesque paintings from the Renaissance. And they're not really considered genre paintings, they're more religious paintings, but um, he sort of evolves into uh, a genre painter. Uh, and from here, he, um, he sort of develops a style uh, on his own. Uh, there's other painters uh, so, such as Peter de Hoek, um, and uh, I believe Bull was another painter that were doing interiors. Uh, so, there's a painting here, The Glass of Wine from 1661. And here we begin to see how he starts developing this unique vision of the interior. Um, there is a narrative, but it's a, you know, it's a genre scene, essentially. He's just taking a, a, just a, a room and setting up some models with just a very simple light structure, the lights coming from left to right. And He's just modeling uh, some beautiful uh, forms. Uh, there's a use of perspective, very sophisticated. 
And this painting does not yet demonstrate his use. I don't believe he used this, uh, he, excuse me, he used the camera skirt in this painting in particular. Um, I do believe that around this time, around 1661 and, and 1662, um, he begins to use uh, the camera obscura. What is the camera obscura? I actually did a live presentation many months ago about the camera obscura. It's essentially a box uh, with a mirror and a lens, and this permits the, the an image to be reflected on a frosted piece of glass. Um, and it results in a quasi photographic image. It's a, it's a beautiful image. You'll see at the end, I, I, I sort of reconstructed the working sequence from the camera obscura. So you'll see how his, this device might have influenced uh, his working method. Let's move on to a very uh, famous painting. Uh, the, this is the art of painting from 1668. And when you look at, if we could put the other painting side by side, uh, the one before, the glass of wine. Let's see if we could put that side by side. You can see that these paintings are not one feels photographic and the other one does not. And okay, let's just go back to the art of painting now. Okay, so there's the art of painting. That painting feels very photographic. I actually had the opportunity to see this painting in Vienna and it's just shocking to see how wonderful this painting is. It's, uh, it, it just feels so contemporary. And um, I was just taken aback by the change of scale in the foreground. This is uh, typical of a photographic image. You, you have a, a distortion in the scale. And indeed, the camera scura sort of gives you these distortions. And that's why uh, a lot of, I believe, a lot of uh, scientists and art historians believe that he used the aid of a camera scura. And when I say the aid, I don't necessarily mean that he was working with, you know, copying exactly the camera scura's image. Here, uh, it's very peculiar. He's, uh, you know, painting an artist working front directly from a model. There is no camera obscura, and it's very interesting to see that the artist is using a gray ground. And if you can see there in that detail, there's the the drawing has been set up with the white chalk. Um, this this is very uh, very telling of Vermeer's technique. He indeed does use uh, a gray ground in a lot of his paintings a warmish gray ground. And uh, in the white chalk drawing would have disappeared. So my theory is that he perhaps transferred the drawing directly onto uh, the canvas from any sort of, uh, he might have uh, you know, done a preparatory study or directly on the canvas, he would have drawn with white chalk. And then from there, he would have moved on to an underpainting stage and built up that the painting in layers. So um, it's just a very telling uh, painting of uh, an artist's process and there's the model. Now in the painting, it shows that there is no underpainting. There's just a white chalk drawing and he's sort of starting with straight color on the uh, wreath of the model. Um, and it seems that Vermeer changes his style. And that's, I keep saying that, uh, you know, I've, I've been approached uh, by some of the viewers um, about you know, sort of defining a definitive style for an artist. And I don't like to do that because as we've seen, artists change their style all throughout their life. So an artist may have start, may, may, you know, may begin with uh, you know, a style using grisaille and then he evolves to not using grisaille. So, um, and that happens to artists. I mean, uh, even in my own work, I don't use the same, uh, you know, the same style, the same technique in every painting. I'm always experimenting, and uh, artists from the past were the same. Um, artists are all constantly trying to, uh, you know, uh, improve their methods or just try out new methods. So that's important to take into account. Uh, I don't like to say or to define this is Vermeer's you know, a style or technique. Uh, there is a series of techniques that he employed, certainly. So um, that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. I have 
uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, images for you guys to study. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the next painting strictly, which is the girl with the pearl earring. Very famous painting. We all know it from movies and from reproductions. It's a wonderful painting. It's a painting that feels to me very photographic. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's almost like he's capturing the moment. Um, and it, the girl's just gazing at us. Uh, and there's a lot of movement in there. Even though it's a very quiet painting, it seems like, you know, he's just capturing her expression in a, you know, in a, in a blink of an eye. So, and I'm very much attracted to that. Uh, the painting, there's a lot of speculation that the painting perhaps is, um, you know, uh, a young woman that he might've been attracted to, but I see it more uh, as a painting of his daughter. I don't know, there's a, a type of, um, there's, there's a lot of love in the painting, a lot of care. And uh, it just seems to me that, uh, you know, the painting transmits that. So, well, all right, so let's just talk a little bit about the technique. So uh, in the uh, link that I'm gonna be sharing with you guys, from Heritage Science, Girl in the Spotlight, there's a series of articles and you could just read through all these articles. There's just chemical analysis. Um, and uh, I just uh, did a lot of notes. I have my notes right here and I'm going to be reading some of these, uh, some of this information because there's a lot. Um, so it seems like Vermeer used, uh, let's just put up that image of the girl with the pearl earring again. Let's see. So it seems like Vermeer uses, uh, you know, a, a, a gray ground. Uh, he establishes this painting with a very, very fine weave linen canvas. Um, and I even did the research on the canvas. And I just want to, I stretched, prepare a canvas here. Let's see. I'm going to show you the canvas that I have. Let me move some of these books. So I want to begin with the canvas because it has a fundamental influence on the final work. So this is the canvas that I prepared. This is exactly the same size that Vermeer would have been using. Okay, He used uh, a size that is almost square. It's not very big. This is, and I'm going to be doing a reconstruction for you guys in the next live presentation. So this is just the beginning stage of just preparing and I prepare the canvas in a very traditional way with the tacks, although they do find that the linen was pre-stretched. It was stretched perhaps on a, on a strainer and then primed. And we no longer use that method of preparing canvas because this is much easier. But in the old days, they probably were using some sort of thread, stretching it on uh, a stretcher bar, and then just applying the rabbit skin glue, almost like a piece of leather. So um, it's very tedious, that process. And today we just use this stretcher bar, let's see here. And we just stretch the canvas here on the side. So uh, it results in a bit, you know, much superior uh, and easier method to work. So one of the things that I found out about this painting is that the linen is very fine. It's about 15 threads per, per centimeter. And this one's 16. Uh, I'm very, very picky about this type of stuff. It's the stuff that I like to, to research. Um, and uh, it's something important because with a canvas this fine, you don't really need to put a lot of, you know, uh, two layers of ground. And, and precisely, he just used one layer of gray ground. Um, and I have here in my notes that his ground composition, uh, he used chalk. And it's primarily chalk. In the first layer, he would have applied. And I, for those of you that have been following the other live presentations, we uh, reconstructed a Rembrandt uh, sand or quartz ground. Uh, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, reconstructing this ground in the next live presentation. Uh, this ground will be composed of 50% chalk, lead white, some earth pigments. Those earth pigments include yellow, uh, yellow earth. Uh, carbon black, and uh, a little bit of red earth. And that will probably yield a very sort of uh, cream colored uh, 
gray, almost like probably this linen color. So I'm going to be doing that in the next live um, presentation, a full painting demonstration. But before, there's a lot of information to share in terms of the materials. So for today, I just wanted to share that uh, initial process. The linen is very fine. I, I bought this linen uh, from, I believe, um, a supplier in New York. I think it's Soho Art Materials. Beautiful piece of linen. It's a portrait linen. And this one's about 16 threads per centimeter. So um, it's very close to what Vermeer would have been using versus the uh, linen that I use for the Rembrandt uh, demonstration that is very, very coarse. And of course, if you're using a lot of texture and dragging the paint with a bristle brush, uh, you would need you know, a coarse weave. But in this case, Vermeer is going for a very, very fine technique. So that makes a fundamental difference. So, okay, so let's just move on. And also, I want to point, point out that uh, there's some information um, in the National Gallery Technical Bulletin that, I, I, you know, that I'm going to be referring to in terms of the medium that Vermeer used. Uh, I used that resource as well. I forgot to mention that. So what do we have here? For those of you that have been following me for a while, uh, you've probably seen this setup. I use a, This is a porphyry stone. And in my past presentations, I have not shown the modeling of the pigments because it is tedious. It does take time. But today I decided to show you, um, you know, just, a, just a, a routine demonstration on how to uh, perhaps prepare a pigment from scratch. So let's just identify the pigments that Vermeer would have been using. Um, they identify in the girl with the pearl earring, uh, lead white, which I prepare already and I have here. And this is just a cup with water, and this is very similar to what painters from the time would have been doing, but instead of using a plastic cups, they would have been putting it in a shell like this. If you live in a tropical paradise, these are everywhere. <laughs> so, but perhaps you could order them from the internet. You could even mix ink in here, um, and you could just put your pigments in there and fill this with water, and that you could preserve your pigments there for perhaps a week or two. So this is, so the paint would go right in there. And there's even images of how artists would preserve the paint in just uh, the shells. Um, also for watercolor. So um, very, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, detail about how, and, and later on, or even around this time, artists were also using uh, pig bladders uh, to, store paint. Uh, but if you put the paint underwater, you're not going to get um, much of a working time. Perhaps a week or two, the skin does, the, excuse me, the paint does form a skin. And you'll, you sort of have to take it out of the, the you know, the, this uh, plastic cup, put it on your palette, break the skin, and then it'll be usable. But it's sort of tedious. So if you want very, very fresh paint, that does, you know, it's not very serviceable serviceable. But if, uh, if you're going for a very rough technique, then this is appropriate, you know? So, okay, so we have lead white. And another paint uh, pigment that they find is, uh, let's see if this will stay, uh, weld. Weld is uh, a pigment that is not very common. Uh, Rembrandt, they don't really find that in Rembrandt. They f Rembrandt used uh, the steel de grain. This is steel de grain that we use the last live presentation. Um, well, this similar. It's an organic color. It's a yellow, organic yellow. Uh, excuse me. It's a yellow. It's an organic yellow from nature, um, and it comes from a root. Um, it is fugitive, but it's considered more permanent than the steel, the grain. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about how Vermeer used it in two seconds. Another wonderful color is uh, lead tin yellow. Lead tin yellow. Just a beautiful uh, color. Um, it's manufactured by essentially heating the lead white to about 900 degrees. It turns into red lead, and from there, it's mixed with tin oxide in a furnace. And you get different shades depending on the temperature of lead tin yellow. Now, in terms of, I, I, I usually get questions about where I get these pigments. Um, these pigments are uh, usually, uh, I buy them from either Kramer pigments or natural pigments 
uh, in California. Some of them, like the light white, I manufacture on my own, and uh, this, the steel, the grain, I manufacture on my own. So some of the some of the pigments I will manufacture on my own, but the earth colors I usually get from either uh, their historical earth pigments. Um, this is raw sienna. Um, this one's from Kramer Pigments. Vermeer might have used this color. Yellow ochre. Okay, right. Let me take out the steel the grain because they don't really find it in this painting. And I'm going to take out the raw sienna as well. I'm just going to focus on the, on the pigments that they find in this painting. Okay, uh, they do find vermilion. Okay, mercury. Okay, uh, red earth. And there's a whole variation of red earth here. You can see this is Venetian red versus Spanish red ochre. And you know which one did he use in particular? They don't really know, but um, you know it's because chemically it's very similar. But it would be somewhat, you know, it's some type of red earth. So I I like to uh, opt for the lighter red earth. There's also some amazing French varieties of red ochre. Um, another great uh, pigment that I absolutely love is the lake. This one in particular is Cochineo Lake, but he could have been using uh, Matter Lake. Sometimes they find a combination of Matter Lake and Cochineo Lake to get the right shade of, of red. So it's important to, in this color, they find everywhere. They find it in the ground, excuse me, they find that in the under layers, in the underpainting, and they find that in the upper, uh, upper layers and also in the shadows. It's a very useful color for my Rembrandt copy. I ended up uh, using that color extensively. And you'll see how Vermeer uh, also is using this color to do the underpainting. So, okay, another beautiful color that uh, Rembrandt probably didn't use as much, uh, it's indigo. Now, this was shocking to me. Uh, I never expected uh, Vermeer to be using indigo. This color is usually associated with Rubens and Van Dyck. They did use indigo, but uh, Vermeer, uh, it doesn't seem like he used too much indigo in, in his other paintings. But in this painting for the background, he mixes weld and indigo in a sort of greenish glaze to saturate the background. And that was shocking to me. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, solution to trying to achieve that depth. Now the painting, that if we could take a look at the girl with the pearl earring image, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, remember that these two colors are fugitive and maybe we could get a detail of the full, full painting. Let's see, there we go. So, um, you know, the, the experienced painter is always looking for that color, saturation, um, the improbable color combination. And that background, believe it or not, had uh, a greenish tint. Now, Vermeer paints, applies this greenish glaze over a black underpainting. And it makes sense. I mean, he, he doesn't want a boring old black background. He wants a depth of color. Um, if, you're, if you uh, are painting a flat black background, you're not going to get that atmospheric perspective. So by applying the indigo and the well together in a greenish glaze, you would get a very saturated, beautiful enamel-like background. Um, so that's another chalking combination that I found, and I was delighted to, to see that. Um, so, but those colors have now faded, and that black, you know, the, the, the background's looking more like a black, like you use black but that was not the case. They do find remnants of the indigo and the well. All right, let's continue here. So another wonderful color that they find is umber, okay? Or some sort of brown, like umber base color, okay? And they find two types of black. This one in particular is bone black, but they also find carbon black. And the last color, that they find, which is just an amazing, amazing color, is uh, lapis lazuli. This is genuine lapis lazuli. I bought this, uh, got it from uh, Natural Pigments. 
Now, it's not a Semino Semini uh, preparation of lapis lazuli, which is the high, very, you know, the, the really uh, high grade uh, of lapis lazuli. And uh, there's a different process. You have to make a plastiline with wax and mastic varnish and uh, to purify the pigment. So, uh, but you could essentially buy this pigment and purify it yourself. So, uh, let's see. I have a question from Alexander. Uh, hello, Alexander. Welcome. Uh, it's good to, to see you here. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, what is the best yellow to make Verdashu? Well, um, so it depends what uh, what type of Verdashu you're you know you're referring to. If you're if you're referring to the traditional Verdashu, uh, here's you know the green earth. But what we're gonna see right now is how uh, Vermeer uh, uses yellow ochre and black uh, in his underpainting, and this is a mixture that I keep running into. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of sources, um, you know, <laughs> they find yellow ochre and black. It's, it's always a mixture. It's a, a mixture that seems to be appearing everywhere. So my record, if you mix yellow ochre and black, you get a beautiful olive green color. And with lead white, you can make it cooler or grayer. Uh, so this combination, uh, and thank you, Alexander, for, you could, you know, if you mix white and, ver and terra verde, you get a beautiful uh, green color for Verdasha, which was used in the early Renaissance. But it seems that um, that sort of, that range of uh, cool, warm, cool relationship is best uh, obtained by using yellow ochre and black. Um, you could also use umber and uh, a green umber and a, a white. Um, that's also, you know, a nice, uh, color, very neutral. But in this case, um, and this was shocking to me, uh, I, for, you know, for years and years and years, thought that Vermeer would have been working with a straightforward white, lead white, and black underpainting. And I've seen a lot of copies uh, here on YouTube and also uh, even at school, uh, some of the exercises that we had to do uh, they, all, they had us do, uh, you know, a Grisaille underlayer, and we had to choose a painter. And a lot of painters would choose Vermeer because he feels very contemporary. So they would opt to uh, do the underpainting with white, lead white, and uh, either ivory black or lamp black. That results in a straightforward gray layer. But to my surprise, um, I uh, dealt very in depth into the chemical analysis. And I have the results here from the uh, Heritage. Uh, again, the results are from uh, Heritage Science. Okay, I'm gonna be sharing that article. And they find two cream underlayers. Okay, and maybe we could get a close up of an extreme close up of her eyes. Let's see. We have a lot of images here, so there we go. So, yeah, so here you can see an extreme close up. So, they find two underlayers composed of lead white, yellow earth, a bit of chalk, occasional portions of red lake, and carbon black, very fine carbon black. And Again, this is not a straightforward black and white painting. There is, uh, if you, you know, if you analyze those colors, we have a white, lead white. We have a yellow, yellow earth. We have occasional portions of lake, which is a red. And we have a carbon black, which is essentially, you know, if you want to break it down in, in terms of primaries, that's essentially the full range. So, um, they describe this underpainting uh, right above a, a monochromatic layer as two cream underlayers. Okay, Pre prior to that, Vermeer uh, is laying in the drawing with bone black and red lake in a sort of wash 
that which we talked about. You saw in the Rembrandt demonstration that I use indeed Bone Black and Red Lake to establish the drawing. So Vermeer is using the very, very same strategy. This is a gray ground. He applies, uh, you know, a, a very thinned out, uh, transparent or, or trans, uh, uh, I guess you could, I guess the, the, the term would be um, uh, not transparent, but it would be uh, semi-transparent. That would be the right term. Uh, so it would be sort of like a, a washy paint, okay, over this gray layer to establish the drawing and the overall composition. And he follows by applying uh, a very solid uh, layer of lead white, yellow earth, red lake and carbon black with uh, fillers of chalk and quartz. Now the quartz, not really sure about, um, they don't, it's, it's not, you know, heavily textured, it's, there's not a lot of texture in it. So the quartz was probably a filler, uh, part of the chalk could have been. So, um, but it doesn't seem like the, it's, he uses a lot of filler. Uh, it's probably to cut, you know, to cut the lead white. I have a question here, let's see. Uh, sweaty palms, yes, Red Lake and Black works for shadows also. Yeah, uh, he, he's essentially leaving the, you know, he's setting up a, a, a under layer, a monochromatic layer, and then they find in the shadows, it's very, very interesting. In the shadow layers, the shadow side, they find translucent, very translucent paint uh, that, contains, let's see, I have it right here. Let's see, I have a lot of notes. Uh, in the upper paint layers in the shadow side, there's lead white, a bit of vermilion, lake color and earth colors. So he's just working with Bellatura essentially. So he finishes the light side by uh, applying very, very thin Bellaturas of lead white, vermilion, red lake, and yellow earth. So very simple technique. Uh, it's uncanny to see how thin the paint is. This is a very, very he you know heavily ground paint. Uh, it's just you know it's just wonderful to see how he applies uh, those very, very thin Bellaturas. Now throughout this whole research, you know I. I, I set out like a little kid. I, I, I kid you not. I, like, I do not know anything. I start reading these articles, and I'm always surprised by what I find. It's almost like detective work. As I was reading this, and for years, and even here on the live presentation, I've done uh, several live presentations about uh, stack process lead white. But I, I you know, the what I what I'm about to tell you is just shocking. Um, Vermeer. Uh, I already had, I was aware that he changed the um, uh, particle size on each layer, meaning he ground the paint finer and finer as he moved up in layers. And you could, you could do that with, if you're grinding your own pigments, instead of grinding the pigments for an hour, you grind them for two hours, right? So what I found in this uh, uh, wonderful uh, journal is that he used two different types of lead white qualities. He used uh, a, a lead white that was rich in hydrocerocyte in the ground layers and in the bottom layers, and a lead white that was rich in sericite in the upper layers. The lead white that is rich in sericite results in a more transparent uh, lead white, meaning that you very, very fine particle size and you could see through it. So. That detail just blew me away. I mean, this was a man that was very obsessive with his materials. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had somebody write to me the other day on my Instagram, and, you know, they were asking me about mediums. And, if folks, if you're not preparing materials from scratch, no medium in the world will give you the range that grinding the pigments will. So, um, I, you know, that's why I'm a big believer in materials. I mean, when you take a look at these chemical analysis, you see a person that is very obsessive with materials. I mean, to choose the two different types of lead white in terms of chemistry, uh, in 
for you know in, in different layers it's just you know, astonishing so um yeah so just a detail that just blew me away i wanted to share with you guys because that is what i you know i i, I really enjoy about this whole search of the old masters and their techniques it's just how knowledgeable they were of their materials and that has been lost in, in you know in part because we buy our materials nowadays so um I want to show you uh, a video uh, of uh, the topography of this wonderful painting. This video is, uh, is posted on the uh, micropanel.com uh, website. And I just want to show you uh, what science is doing nowadays or with these paintings. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a walkthrough, just you know, narrate um, what, I, what I was able to observe. All right, let's just take a look at that video. So here you can see an extreme, if you log on to this wonderful website, here you can see an extreme close-up and you could do a 3D uh, view of the topography of the paint. And there, I'm, this is a pre-recorded video um, and you can see, I'm just turning they have different details that are, they, they focused on. And this is the impasto highlight. And uh, the National Gallery Technical Bulletin identify uh, some of these highlights as key bodied walnut oil in some of his paintings, not in this one in particular. In this one, they, they were not able to do the, uh, you know, the chemical analysis of the medium. But um, indeed, they do find heat bodied linseed oil in the layer. And the highlights uh, raised somewhat. Look at how he just puts a tiny bit of a glaze around the highlight just to get that, you know, that, that halo effect. Just very, very, very beautiful. Um, and there's just some very beautiful velatura. The paint is thinned out. That means the paint is, and this painting is also abraded. It's important to, to, to mention that. It's been heavily cleaned, so. The surface does look a little abraded. But uh, there you can see the topography of the paint and uh, the areas that are raised, where he's using thicker paint, where he's using thinner paint. Um, and this is important for a painter because, you know, this Vermeer is an artist that's not really using a lot of texture. Uh, but in his highlights, he is, he's, you know, he's applying the paint very thickly. Well, uh, it's a, it's a medium-rich paint. That means that the oil that he was using was probably very well purified. Now, this is a detail of the lips. Wonderful. Look at how he's just applying those highlights and the soft edges. It's just velaturas. The paint is just thinned out. Uh, or, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of white. There you can see the underlayer. It's this grayish, greenish underlayer. Um, and he's using these dots to just sort of apply the highlights. Um, there's uh, some evidence that he might have used uh, some egg tempera for the highlights. I had another viewer here, um, subscribe, subscriber, that uh, you know uh, pointed out the use of egg tempera in Caravaggio. So and this is probably uh, tempera grassa. There is a glaze of ultramarine blue or, or uh, lapis lazuli and for this underpainting, they find black. Then he applies a layer of uh, lead white right over the ground, and then a, a final glaze of just pure lapis lazuli. Uh, so there you can see how he's just layering one color on top of another. This is lead tin yellow, and it, there's yellow ochre. This is from her jacket. And there you can see the big granules of lapis lazuli. And this is almost like you know, going to the moon for me. I mean, it's just seeing, I would never be able to see. There you see the big particles of lapis lazuli mixed with the yellow ochre for the jacket and the highlight of lead tin yellow. Uh, you know, look at the paint quality. It's, you know, it's medium rich. Uh, the medium has not, you know, uh, it's not yellow uh, that much, uh, meaning that it's thoroughly mixed. 
uh, and probably, you know, it has yellow over time, but it's not, it, you know, the paint is not, it's well mixed. That's what I, that's what I meant. Um, it's well bound. So wonderful. Uh, this is the pearl itself. And look at, it's just a scumble of brown. Uh, you know, you have a brown under layer, the lead white thinned out in one area, a scumble, okay, to supply to get the turbid medium effect. And, uh, and then the, the very thick highlight. Um, wonderful, just, just wonderful economy. And look how the, the, the area, the paint that has been thinned out has yellow somewhat because it has more medium, right? So those are the sort of clues that I like to see uh, and investigate when I'm looking at these paintings. Um, so this is just a wonderful resource, uh, just amazing just to see uh, you know, this, uh, this technology being used to, uh, you know, to great effect. So check it out, micropano.com, I believe. Um, and you could yourself, you know, just navigate through the <laughs> pearl with a pearl earring. So, all right, well, so I want to talk a little bit about the pigments and how to prepare the pigments. So uh, I decided to prepare some lapis lazuli and this is probably the most prized pigment uh, available. It's still a very expensive pigment. You could get it from uh, Kramer Pigments, uh, also from uh, naturalpigments.com. Wonderful, wonderful materials. Let's see. And this is just sort of in preparation for my next live presentation, which will be uh, you know, I will be recreating this technique uh, with a copy. So using historical materials. Remember that I like to use the historical materials. This is really important because, uh, you know, modern paint is not, it's not, does not behave in the same, same way that, you know, uh, traditional handmade paint. So, um, all right. Well, so in terms of uh, lapis lazuli, just a wonderful pigment. It's highly priced and it was used, uh, doesn't have a lot of covering power. Um, this pigment, uh, you know, you'll see that I'm just gonna use a tiny bit of, of paint and Vermeer would have prepared just a very fresh, you know, very fresh batch and just applied it fresh on, you know, on the painting. Uh, they, they had no way of uh, storing these colors for a long time. So most likely a color like this would have been prepared fresh. Same thing with the vermilion and uh, in the prized colors. And the reason that I'm talking about this is because um, why in underpainting? A lot, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of these classical paintings by the old masters had always they always have a grisaille layer or so, so, some sort of monochromatic underpainting. And uh, why are they doing this? Well, the reason is because imagine that you have to uh, nowadays we have you know, a tube of paint like this. I mean, I tube my own handmade paint. I make handmade paint and I tube it. So it's very convenient. But if I'm, if I'm, uh, you know, and of course this invention in the 19th century really gave us a lot, you know, I mean, you could make paint, store it and use it at a later time. But in the 17th century, they didn't have that invention. So you would have had to make enough paint, uh, you know, if you're, setting out to establish a painting, you would probably want to use the least amount of colors. So in this case, he used yellow ochre, black and white, and some touches of red here and there. So three colors. So that really implies just taking out three colors, right? And having to grind three individual colors. And the cleanup of a stone is the paint. So that means that if you start with a very dark color, it'll take you half an hour to clean this color in order for you to switch. So you don't want to use a lot of, you know, dirty up this whole stone. So you probably want to prepare the, the paint in small amounts, okay? So you could just clean it very, very fast and move on to the next color. As a rule of thumb, I start with the lightest color, okay? So in this case, it would be lead white, okay? I will grind, prepare my lead white first, my yellow ochre second, and my uh, 
uh, you know, bone black or carbon black last, right? So if the bone black gets polluted with the yellow ochre, it doesn't, won't really matter. So probably what they find is precisely that, precisely the fact that, you know, you find, they find all these colors in one layer, it may not mean that the artists use all those colors. So that's important to take into account. So um, in this case, you, the artist would have, you know, done a, a, a small batch, prepare a small batch of lead white, move on to the next color, which is slightly darker. And by the time that he was preparing the black, he, you know, the black would contain these, you know, contaminants of these two other colors. It's the best way to do it because you don't want to clean the, the stone perfectly. I mean, that would take a long time, right? If you're starting in the morning. So another uh, strategy that painters had was to prepare the colors the night before. And Palomino and a lot of other painters do mention that. So you have to have a strategy if you're going to make your own, uh, you know, your own paints. Uh, I usually just uh, prepare, uh, you know, two tubes of color at a time and I store them. But that's not the case with the old masters. So in the case of the very, very uh, bright colors, the very fine colors, you, you would just prepare fresh. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you here. Just a very simple operation. Now this, this color is very finely ground. Look at what a gorgeous color that is. Okay, that's about $60 right there. <laughs> that's okay, you're worth it. You're a great crowd. Okay, this is uh, Afghanistan Lapis Lazuli, beautiful color. Okay, I'm just gonna prepare a little bit. I'm just going to show you, I'm gonna use heat bodied walnut oil, okay. Uh, at some point, I'm going to do a live presentation on how to prepare this heat body walnut oil. Okay. And why am I using heat body walnut oil? Well, it's a blue. And you don't want to use the yellow, the more yellowing linseed oil. So it's a rule of thumb that would use uh, heat body walnut oil. Vermeer probably used uh, heat body walnut oil. Perhaps he used linseed oil. I don't have the chemical analysis to determine that. But it seems that he used both walnut and linseed oil. So, and you have to be very, very careful. I just use a few drops to wet the pigment. Okay. And this is, this is for a glaze. You know, if I'm going to do a glaze, uh, if I'm doing a lot of color, of course, I would prepare, you know, grind, uh, pigment wet first to reduce the particle size. And then uh, I would, you know, have a big batch, mix it with oil, then put it aside and then mull it in small amounts called moladas. The Spaniards call that moladas, meaning, you know, small amounts to, to grind. And what a gorgeous color that is. Notice how I'm just not using a lot of oil, but in this case, because it is a glazing color, you do want to use a nice amount of oil because you want the paint to flow. What a gorgeous color that is. I don't know if the camera could pick it up. It needs light. So just mixing it with the palette knife is just not enough. You'll see that. And I'm going to show you just a tiny trick here, just to raise the refractive index of, of the lapis lazuli. And it's a trick that they find consistently in Vermeer and in other artists as well. So once you have this, Okay, you're grinding the color. You don't want to grind too much because if you grind the blues too much, you're going to reduce their particle size and they become duller. Okay. So that is well documented by Pacheco. Okay, and now that I have the color, okay, mixed, and I don't want to, again, it's very, very light grind.
Now I'm gonna introduce a material that will make this a lot brighter. I'm gonna take a little bit of chalk This will make the blue just really, really nice. A lot lighter in color. And somewhat opaque. It'll have somewhat of a covering power. So now I've, I've transformed this pigment from a very, very transparent pigment to a pigment that you could essentially use as body color. And they do find evidence that he used some of this blue in the flesh. Not a lot. They find some small particles. And a lot of contemporary artists use, uh, here's the color. The lapis, excuse me, uh, ultra, ultramarine blue and the flesh. So Vermeer was already uh, ahead of his time by introducing blue, beautiful blue, ultramarine, the flesh color. I have a question here. This is, this is calcite. This is calcite. Yes. But you could use, you could use, uh, Marble dust as well. The, the trick is not to, to, you know, not to use too much. This also helps with the consistency of the paint. And it just gives you that sort of translucent quality, not transparent because the lapis lazuli is just too transparent. So uh, now you have a paint that you could easily handle with the brush, you know, and apply. Let's just see if I'm gonna apply here on a surface. There's the lapis lazuli, beautiful color. It's just, uh, it, you can see that it's not fully transparent. It has a little bit of body. And if I thin it down, so this is the blue that Vermeer would have been using in his painting and maybe we could get the image again up in the just two. Now this is not a Sanino Sanini blue. Uh, you know he and imagine that he's putting you know this color over uh, the black underpainting right so that's what you get in the shadow side. He would have been applying the color transparent color over the black underpainting on the shadow side. So the color was seen darker and then perhaps as final glaze. So this is all, you know, very important when you're, you know, uh, you're analyzing his technique and that's the sort of things that I'm gonna be working with, uh, you know, in, in, in the next live presentation when I do the copy. So uh, in terms of the Latin yellow, um, it seems that he used, uh, you know, just a straightforward Latin yellow. Uh, he applies some touches. And there's also something very peculiar that I learned um, when you know, I was studying uh, the, the chemical analysis. And it's that he seems to have left the, the underpainting and the borders. Let's just take a look at one of the images. Um, his borders are uh, nothing but the, the uh, brown underpainting. So, uh, you know, he applies, it's a gray ground. He's applying, he's setting up the painting with a brown uh, underpainting or brown under sketch of uh, bone black and lake. And he leaves a halo of that brown underpainting around uh, the, the figure. And that acts as sort of the turning, uh, you know, uh, of the form on the edge. So it's not a sharp edge against the background. So that was a very telling uh, technique 
Uh, I've, I've seen that in some of his painting, other painters as well, like Rubens and Velasquez. But it, it was neat to see uh, Vermeer employ, you know, in a, in a different way. He overlaps, you know, sometimes the colors are overlapped. The underpainting uh, seems to, uh, you know, uh, sort of melt into uh, the under, under layer and then the overpainting. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not covering, it's just sort of juxtaposed. So that was very interesting. So I'm gonna be sharing this article with you guys, the link, uh, I'm gonna put it in the description below. And before I go, I just wanna uh, thank you for coming by. I hope that you learned a few things. Um, and I also wanna tell you, uh, if, uh, you know, about, um, oh, yes, of course, I have one last video. Uh, I have my uh, wonderful partner here, uh, reminding me that we have one last video of the use of the camera obscura. Of course, that's why you all came uh, to see. So let's just take a look uh, at this wonderful video. Uh, this is a theoretical uh, working sequence of how Vermeer would have used a camera obscura. I built this camera obscura when I was a student and you know, I, using a 17th century design. So this is essentially uh, probably what he would have done, or perhaps not. So let's just take a look at that video. So look at what a beautiful image we have here. Uh, this is my lovely girlfriend. Uh, she, thank you for posting. Uh, this, there's a uh, camera obscura and it has a small opening and there's the image. And he might or might not have traced the drawing or at least establish a sort of underdrawing. And from there, I mean, it's not very difficult. You just, you could just establish an underdrawing very easily, okay? And uh, once you have the underdrawing finished uh, or the sketch or the, you know, tracing, there is a sketch, okay? You could just transfer that to your canvas and uh, by means of you know uh, tracing it, or you could just square it off. Um, so it would be very easy for Vermeer to have uh, employed this method. Uh, I don't think he traced the image, uh, you know, uh, completely. I think he probably uh, looked at the image and just sketched from it loosely. Uh, he probably measured some proportions, and that's the reason that. You know, he, he probably was able to, by fixing the drawing on the glass, you could have the model assume the same pose over and over. And if the model's not there, you could still measure the proportions. So wonderful uh, resource, the camera obscura. The image is absolutely beautiful. And, um, and yeah, so, uh, so this is, these are theoretical, again, these are theoretical, um, uh, uh, setups that I that I like to think about that I like to share with you. Uh, as a student, I was very curious, um, and when I go to the museums and I look at a, a painting by by Vermeer, um, it reminds me of a photograph. Um, and uh, not in its entirety. There's something mysterious about it. And the camera scare, as you saw, um, it does have that, convey that quality, especially in the highlights. So whether he copied the image directly from the camera obscura, I can't really tell you for sure, but it's just a theory. I think he used it as a tool. Uh, I, I had some, someone write me in my Instagram account. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, using the camera obscura is cheating? And I say, well, you know, uh, I, we, we, Artists and artifice, you know? So if you're using uh, a tool to help you, well, so be it. Uh, my only reservation about that is that use it creatively. Uh, try to create something for yourself. And in the case of Vermeer, he, he indeed created some compelling images. It's not just a copy, you know, camera square image. Uh, there's a lot of intelligence there. There's just a lot of beautiful subtlety. So, uh, all those are the qualities that are going to transcend, you know, uh, your art. And if you're using 
Camera Curiosity tool, well, so be it. So, all right, well, uh, we had a lot, a lot of ground to cover. Um, and in the next live presentation, I'm going to uh, be starting uh, a copy or I'm going to demonstrate how I, uh, you know, work with the copy. Um, and, you know, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And before I go, I want to tell you a little bit about my courses. Uh, for those of you, now, these are, these are very, very in-depth uh, live presentations about the art of painting. And maybe some of you are coming by and you're, you know, just sort of exploring and you're not really sure what an underpainting is or, you know, uh, what is proportion or how to get a drawing or an underdrawing. So I have uh, designed uh, three courses for uh, beginner level students that are uh, hosted on the Udemy server. Um, and you can check those out in the description below. Uh, they're meant for anybody that's just wanting to undertake uh, the art of drawing, classical drawing, and sort of begin uh, assembling knowledge about drawing and painting. So uh, you can find the links in the description below. Uh, I have three courses. I have one on classical drawing, uh, classical drawing materials and techniques, and one on portrait drawing. So, and soon I will have a Rembrandt uh, painting technique uh, course as well. So again, check that out. Uh, for those of you that are coming by, uh, you could also check out my Instagram account, Luis Borrero Art, uh, and you could follow me on there. Uh, if, you're, if you're a Spanish speaker, you could uh, log on to my atelier, live presentations. We have a whole other set of live presentations in Spanish. Uh, on ateliersanjuan.org. Uh, I also do live classes for students that are more advanced or wanting to, you know, uh, to get a critique, a personal critique. So you could find that information at ateliersanjuan.org. So just a lot of information uh, to share, a lot of resources. Um, I'm very thankful for your wonderful support. Uh, we're almost at 900 uh, subscribers, and that that's just exciting. You know, it's good to see that. People appreciate art. Uh, they want to learn about these old techniques. Uh, this is not contemporary art by no means, you know. Although you know we are contemporary artists, but it's good to learn from artists from the past. So, if uh, let's see, I think we have, we have a question. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. From Mick. Mick, thank you for coming by. Um, what was the link to the 3D Vermeer? So it's micro pano, P A N O dot org. We're going to, I'm going to be uh, writing it down uh, in the comments uh, as soon as the live presentation finishes. Micro uh, pano dot com. Uh, yeah, so that's, they don't have the articles in that, in that uh, link. It's just the 3D imaging. So let's see. Uh, oh, so we have a Udemy broken link. Okay, well, I will be able to, uh, to I'll make sure to fix that. Thank you, sweaty pants or sweat, sweat, sweaty palms. I'm sorry. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you very much for your wonderful support. Uh, you know, keep practicing at home. For those of you that are looking for traditional materials, I'm also going to be uh, sharing some links. I get a lot of questions about, you know, uh, where I'm getting my materials. So again, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the live presentations, and I wish everyone a safe weekend. Thank you.